Yes. Let's let's kick it off. So it's a little bit past 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night. That means you know we are at Trivago Academy. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me how did I randomly came up to this to this topic and to the idea of inviting Professor Repisarda uh, today, but. I'll have to share this like super short story. I came upon an article, I think it was by Vice or some similar you know, online media that actually reviewed uh, Professor's uh, work. I think it was a recent, recent article from 2017. Uh, oh, okay. It's in February. Yeah, so the article uh, was um, reviewing the work uh, looking for a correlation between luck and the career success. And uh, it was a very engaging article, and if you have a chance, you know, please uh, check it online. Um, the answer is no. Or wait, because it's a luck and a, and a career, you know, the answer is yes. In order to be <laughs> successful in your career, you have to be lucky. A little bit. A little bit. So you know, I said, "Hey, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic. You know, like how can luck actually determine the outcome? Not only in some like physical experiments or, or randomness. I'm sorry, randomness uh, determine the outcomes of some scientific experiments, but also influence our day-to-day -day lives." And uh, you know, we did a little bit of research, and it ended up being that Professor Repsarda from University of Catania has spent the last 20 years researching the questions of chaos, randomness, and you know, at the end of it, luck. So please give a warm welcome and uh, enjoy, friends. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Actually, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to talk to you. And uh, it doesn't happen so often that uh, I give this talk to people who are not uh, academic or students. So I think it's quite stimulating for me uh, to interact with you. And please interrupt me uh, if you have questions or uh, if you want to know more detail about what I will say. Actually, uh, I'm a physicist. I work in Catania. Uh, although I have also other affiliation, I'm affiliated with this complexity science hub in Vienna. And uh, I'll, uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, so in principle things are uh, very strange, but uh, uh, I actually I can go on. <clears throat> I'll tell you the story about uh, uh, the beneficial effects of randomness which I've been investigating in the last uh, 10 years, let's say. Sorry. So the summary of my talk is this one. I will uh, uh, discuss about some examples where uh, randomness can have a very beneficial uh, effect. And uh, the last part of my talk will be about talent versus luck, which is this last paper that is still not published, but uh, it had an explosion of uh, uh, reactions uh, on social media for some reasons that I, I'll try, I don't understand completely, but I'll try to explain. So my story, I'm a theoretical physicist, but my mainly uh, focus of research is statistical mechanics and complex systems. <clears throat> what is a complex system? Uh, I'm sure that some of you probably know, complex system is uh, a system which is uh, made of many uh, uh, components, elementary components, uh, which interact among them in a non-linear way. What does it mean, non-linear way? It means that if you study the components uh, uh, one by one, they behave in, in, in a certain way. But when they uh, interact among each other, the result uh, is something completely unexpected. In fact, you see an emergent behavior, which is uh, not uh, uh, in the details of the uh, behavior of the single components. And, um, and uh, usually you have something very unpredictable. And uh, usually these systems are out of equilibrium at the edge of chaos. So we say it is in between order and disorder. And uh, they usually have a kind of hierarchical fractal structure, okay? 
What are the examples of complex systems? In physics, uh, long-range interacting systems, you know, plasmas or gravitational objects, uh, for example. But uh, the most complex systems are biological systems, the brain, DNA, or uh, ecological systems, uh, ecosystems, uh, social systems, uh, communities of animals or individuals, uh, financial markets, uh, or computer networks, uh, or uh, uh, World Wide Web, uh, things like that. I mean, when you have uh, a system made of, of many interacting components uh, in a non-linear way, and uh, usually you have this kind of behavior. So, why are physicists study this kind of systems? Because we, you, you might think that, uh, I mean, yeah, I should remain in the realm of physics. It is because <clears throat> Uh, most of the techniques and uh, methodologies that have been developed in physics can be uh, extrapolated to other fields, uh, and this gives often uh, changing the meaning of, the, of, the, of things, uh, a more rigorous uh, investigation of what's going on. A few examples. <clears throat> How many of you know Mexican waves? <clears throat> things like that. <clears throat> things like that is just... Uh, an example of an emerging behavior. It's not organized. It emerges out of a single uh, behavior. And uh, people, although maybe may uh, very, I mean, the behavior of single people may be uh, very different, when you are in that situation, you can stay, sit, or uh, stay up. So, your behavior becomes very simple. And you can study this in a very rigorous way. It has been studied by several physicists, and it can be predicted. And there is no leader. I mean, it emerges when you reach a certain kind of density, and uh, it moves always with a, uh, the same velocity in the same direction. And uh, there was a paper published a few years ago in Nature. This is another example, flocks of birds. <clears throat> I mean. Uh, this is, seems coordinated, but actually there is no leader also in that case. They form these flocks in order to avoid the, the attacks of other birds. And uh, simply they form these, uh, these flocks just looking at their neighbors. <clears throat> looking at their neighbors, which are not exactly the, the first neighbors. Okay? In this way, they are able to organize and to to, uh, to form these kind of things. And these things can be studied very rigorously. Uh, this is uh, the uh, paper on Mexican waves on nature a few years ago. And this is a, a paper on uh, PNAS, <clears throat> also by some Italian physicists, uh, uh, well-known Italian physicists, about study of uh, flocks in Rome. Okay. So this is why physicists are interested in this kind of things, because they've studied similar things in physics, and now they export this kind of techniques outside physics. OK. <clears throat> but now, since 2009, I started to investigate the role of noise and random strategies inside the, the field of complex systems. It may seem irrational, not scientific. I mean, why random? <laughs> but I try to convince that this is not the case. And uh, let's start with this slide. This slide uh, is uh, important because it's probably the oldest example of random strategies in taking important decisions. Uh, it is reported that Herodotus <clears throat> was an historical, a story, well, okay. <laughs> an old <laughs> Greek, uh, reported about Persians that uh, they usually took uh, important decisions first when they were drunk, and then they discussed it again when they were sober. Why? Because uh, in this way, and if they, uh, they thought that the decision was correct, they accepted. Why is that? Because very often we have a lot of prejudice. We think that things cannot be done. And so we do not try new things just because we think it cannot be done. When you uh, uh, are drunk, then uh, you don't think about that. You overcome your barriers. And you, maybe you can find new, new perspective and new ways to solve your problems. <clears throat> so this is a quite old example. But there are actually many 
examples in physics where you use random numbers, which are not easy to produce, actually, uh, in order to uh, solve very complicated integrals, for example, the Monte Carlo method, which takes the name after the Monte Carlo town uh, full of casinos. And it just because <coughs> random numbers were used uh, during the Manhattan Project, and the, uh, the technique was invented by a mathematician, uh, Polish mathematician, Ulam, and uh, uh, an American metropolis, and also for Neumann and others, in order to, uh, uh, to solve very difficult problems uh, in, uh, for the construction of the atomic bomb. And since then, uh, in physics, uh, but not only in physics, the Monte Carlo methods, the use of random numbers to solve very complicated integrals, uh, has been used everywhere. So this is one example where you use random numbers in, uh, uh, in physics or in scientific uh, problems. Another one is, uh, is this one, this example, maybe it's a bit too technical, but uh, it's, called, uh, it's called stochastic resonance, and it was discovered in the 80s in Rome by the uh, Italian group of physicists led by Giorgio Parisi. And what is that? They were studying climatic change. You know that there are uh, periodic oscillations between uh, uh, glaciation and uh, hot periods. Uh, and uh, they didn't understand how this system behaved because uh, it, was, it wasn't stable. So they need some, some noise coming from the effect of other planets. And so they found this uh, mechanism, which has the name of stochastic resonance, which works like that. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Sorry. Should start the video. <laughs> Okay, so suppose you have a periodic signal and a bistable system, and the system should oscillate between one and the other, but it's not able to do that. Then if you add a, a small uh, fine-tuned noise, the system is able to uh, oscillate periodically from one well to the other. This is called stochastic resonance. And what's the reason of, of, of that problem? <clears throat> And this has many applications in physics. So noise is important, can be useful. And a very common example is when you have a key, it doesn't open your door. What you do, you usually oscillate it a little. And this very often works. This is something that usually works, because you overcome the difficulties and you are able to enter. So this is, let's say, physics engineer example. Now can be useful also in social sciences or in economic sciences. <coughs> yes, and I will show a first example uh, speaking to you uh, about the Peter Principle. How many of you know about the Peter Principle? You know, okay, <laughs> very well. <laughs> so, <coughs> this is the paper that was published in 2010, and uh, the problem is like this. Suppose you have a hierarchical group structure in which you have a, a vacancy. Someone retired or uh, changed his job. So you have to replace that person. What is your first uh, uh, thing that, you, uh, that, you, that comes to, to you? I mean, you take someone from a lower level and you put there. Okay? You think that uh, maybe you take the best at the lower level, uh, imagining that uh, it will continue to be uh, also the best at the higher level. Well, but this is not always the case. Suppose you have a team in which your forward player is missing, would you, and the best of your players is a goalkeeper. Would you put your goalkeeper as a forward player? Of course not, because everyone has a task, <coughs> and everyone is the best in that task. So this doesn't work in sports, but it, it doesn't work also in, in the administration, in the, in the organization. And in fact, uh, Peter noticed that uh, in the 60s, and uh, he wrote a, a very famous uh, uh, book, uh, uh, very popular, The Peter Principle, after his name, Why Things Always Go Wrong. Uh, but he's... Uh, uh, his study was almost empirical, okay? So, uh, we uh, just uh, uh, started to work in that direction just for fun because this paper, this, uh, this book was uh, reprinted in Italy in 2008 
just by chance, uh, uh, we found it in a library in, in Milan, and uh, we started simulating this, this problem. <clears throat> so, what is the Peter Principle? What the Peter Principle says is that, uh, simplify it, every new member in a hierarchical organization climbs the hierarchy until he or she reaches his or her level of incompetence. That means that you are promoted because you do something very well. You may be in the new level, continue to uh, perform very well, but it, then at a certain time, you stop performing so well because, uh, I mean, tasks are very different from what you are the best. And then you stop there. You have reached the top level, no one will fire you, and you remain there, but you are incompetent. You are not the best at, in that level. In this sense, uh, incompetence rises the, the, the hierarchy, and there is also a corollary <laughs> that uh, most of the work is done by those who uh, remain below you. <clears throat> well, this is something that uh, may seem funny, but actually uh, I think it's true in the sense that every one of us uh, has an example of that kind. A researcher, a very good researcher who is not uh, very good at teaching, or a soldier who is not very good at com uh, uh, commanding, uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but as physicists, we should be able to quantify and uh, study it in a very rigorous way. So that's why we started this project, just for fun, actually. And so we constructed a computer model, uh, which is like this. Uh, it has this uh, hierarchical structure. You see there are six levels. Uh, in, uh, in each level, there are a certain number of uh, employees with a uh, distribution of competence. It's a Gaussian distribution with a certain standard deviation, a certain average. Everyone has a certain age. Time passes. Uh, Year by year, when you reach the age of 60, you, are, you retire, and so there is a vacancy, okay? And um, every level has a um, number which is here to represent the responsibility of people at that level. Well, we work with two different hypotheses now. The common sense one, which is the one I explained before, which is uh, uh, People maintains their competence, okay? This is what we usually expect. And so when you are promoted, we maintain the same competence, which is given initially, with a small random error, a small uncertainty. The second uh, hypothesis, on the other hand, is the Peter hypothesis that the agent does not keep the same competence because the task is completely different. So when you promote him, you uh, throw the dice again, and you assign a new competence to that guy, okay? So with these two hypotheses, we run our model. And uh, this is what comes out, comes out, of course, after many repetitions. Uh, it doesn't matter how long is your career, but uh, uh, you see here, for three levels, four levels, five levels, six levels, you end up always, when you are in the Peter hypothesis, that means when you throw dice, when you promote people, you always finish in, um, in, the, uh, in a lower competence. Okay? So this proves numerically, of course, it's not a theorem, that Peter was right. <clears throat> when, when you do it statistically, this comes out uh, very easily. Okay. So, now, the problem is there. We have to solve it. How can we solve it? First of all, let's try to define an efficiency of your organization in order to quantify the level of efficiency that you can reach. Uh, an easy way to, to do it is just to multiply the competence, uh, capital C, of the entire level for the responsibility of that level, and you then normalize in order to get something. I mean, the, the best efficiency is when everyone is at the best. Oh, oh, okay. 
So uh, with this, you can uh, quantify uh, the efficiency of your organization. And then you run, you run a simple, uh, this is done in NetLogo. Uh, this is the first hypothesis is that you are in the common sense hypothesis and you promote the most competent to the new level. And you see that the efficiency actually rise because this is correct. When you are in the common sense, you should promote the best because he maintains his competence. Okay, but if you are in the Peter hypothesis, then that means that then when the competence is not maintained, then the efficiency decreases, okay, if you promote the most competent. Let's see what happens next. Now, you promote the less competent, and of course it increases because it can only increase uh, the efficiency because if you move someone who is not doing well and uh, you throw the dice again, it's very much probable that uh, it will be much more performant in the, in the new level. <clears throat> but now, uh, let's wait a little. Common sense, less competent, of course, it goes down again because it's not correct. But now, it doesn't matter if you use the uh, common sense hypothesis or the Peter hypothesis, if you promote in a random way, now it comes. You always get a positive effect. <clears throat> So it doesn't matter which hypothesis you work on. I mean, if you don't know, because it's difficult to know which is the best hypothesis, you always get a, a positive effect, an increase in your efficiency, uh, whichever is the, uh, is the, uh, the hypothesis, the working hypothesis. So this was our solution. Uh, being inspired by many physical examples, we applied it to uh, the Peter Principle. And this is because, upon, uh, as I was saying, in general, you don't know which is the, the, the hypothesis. Uh, of course, you should uh, do interviews and things, but uh, I mean, if you are blind, completely blind, uh, doing like that, like that is completely costless. You promote in a random way, and then it works. This is just a summary, <clears throat> and you see uh, what I have already shown, that it's not much, but it's always positive. And also, alternating uh, the two kinds of promotion, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good thing, but it's not very different from a random way. The Peter Principle can be generalized because uh, uh, it doesn't work only for uh, organization. I mean, suppose you have a, a, a tool you can use a hammer to break a glass, but you cannot use a, ham a hammer to demolish a building. It's better you start from scratch, thinking a completely new thing. That's, that's the idea, and that's what that works for models, theories, uh, whatever, whatever, also in your daily life. You have a problem, and uh, you usually borrow an idea from a similar problem, but it's, it's not sure that it works. Sometimes it's better to start from scratch. Well, this is a funny story, but it's related also to randomness in some sense, because uh, we wrote that, uh, that paper, we put it online, uh, this is something quite usual in, uh, in our field, before publishing it, we put it online so that colleagues can see it. Okay, it was summer, we went on vacation, and immediately this, uh, this paper got a lot of, of popularity. It was first noticed by this blog, by MIT Technology Review, then uh, by the, the blog of the Democratic Party in the United States, and uh, also by the New York Times, which put it also among the most interesting ideas of that year. It was 2009, the paper was still not published at that time. And then also, okay, there were many, many articles, also an editorial by the new scientist. 
I mean, because in the Anglo-Saxon culture, uh, this, uh, this, this kind of thing was quite popular. So uh, having found uh, a solution to this problem was really something that uh, uh, stimulates people, was very inspiring for them. For us, it was just for fun, but OK. We discovered that it's not just fun. And then the nice thing, that we got also the Nobel Prize. I don't know how many of you know what is the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize is something uh, which is given every year at Harvard uh, to 10 uh, uh, papers which uh, uh, make first laugh and then think. And usually very good papers uh, published in uh, journals like Science, Nature, got it in the past. Because uh, they were quite strange. I mean, uh, science sometimes can seem funny because uh, people uh, look at it at, uh, from different perspectives, but it was not meant to be fun, but uh, it could have a fun side. After all, uh, scientists sometimes uh, can be also very creative in some sense. So we were a bit uncertain because uh, we didn't know very well uh, this, this prize. Of course, it's not money. I mean, you have to go there. You have to keep it secret for months uh, because they, disc they say the name only uh, during the ceremony, uh, which is quite funny. But since uh, we discovered that uh, these two guys, uh, which were quite famous, uh, got the Nobel, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we thought it would be nice to go there. So we maintained the secret also with our families. Uh, we told them that uh, let's go to, to the States for a vacation, and then we participate to this ceremony. <clears throat> Andre Game, the same year, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the graphene, which is a very interesting material. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, we got this, this prize by some really Nobel Prize, in our case, Frank Wilczek. Uh, other Nobel physicists were, were there, just sitting there. It's a, it's a very funny, funny. Uh, you can look at it uh, on YouTube, but there are many videos on that. And, uh, and these are the group. I mean, this is the organizer of the prize. Mark Abrams, and these are uh, the other collaborators, Alessandro Pluchino, who is a physicist, and Cesare Garofaro, who is a sociologist, who participated in this paper. So the, the, the paper had become really famous, really popular, <clears throat> and we were a bit worried because uh, we didn't know at the time if the results we had found were quite general. <clears throat> okay, we had our model, but we didn't know how robust were our results. So we generalized our model, <coughs> changing some features in another paper. For example, we changed the topology of our networks. We increased the number of agents. Uh, you could be promoted also from one level to the other through some this kind of modules. <coughs> and. Uh, we also changed the unit of time, which instead of one year became one month. And uh, we uh, calculated the efficiency with respect to a, a kind of meritocratic initial regime. So we changed a little, we improved the model. And what we found is that uh, it's not important whatever is the, the way you promote people, I mean, uh, from one level to the other, if you follow the links or just from one level to the other you always get uh, an increase in efficiency of, of uh, uh, your system. Also, if you give a certain percentage of random promotion, I mean, you can promote only a certain fraction of people, not completely in a random way. This gives you always a, an advantage. <clears throat> and. Uh, this is the first 20 years of these organizations, and you see how it increases. <clears throat> it's not much, but it's something. So we were quite happy because the results were robust, and, uh, and actually uh, it was not a very special case, what we found at the beginning. But now we started to 
understand more deeply our result. It's so counterintuitive, after all, what we found. There is a game theory, uh, there was this interesting paper published in Nature, uh, in which they, uh, the researchers studied two uh, biased games <coughs> with coins. Both of them are losing games. If you uh, uh, play only one of them, you, get, uh, you lose uh, money. But if you alternate them, or if you play them in a random way, you see an increase in your capital. So they are winning. <clears throat> this was partly uh, a paper that inspired the use of our random uh, strategies for the Peter Principle. Uh, then we discovered that there were other analytical results in similar situations that proved the same way. And this was done by Satinover and Sornet in Zurich. And, uh, but then, if you think of it, natural selection works like this. I mean, you have random uh, uh, mutation, which are then selected uh, by evolution. So it's not so strange. It's a kind of uh, uh, bottom-up strategy. Okay, and also science works like that. If your your student has a nice idea, uh, and yeah, the idea is nice and uh, it is accepted, even if it's not the professor, who is, who at least it should work like that, and very often it works like that. <coughs> For the benefits of random selections is that uh, you avoid corruption, you avoid nepotism in the uh, organization. Uh, also in democracy, in fact, this was another application that we did in Athens. There were no elections. People were sorted and participated, almost everyone, apart from women at that time and slaves, participated in the assembly just by, by lot. So they were sorted by lot. Uh, the, they stayed one year in charge and uh, they had to work well because then uh, they had to respond to what they did. <clears throat> But there is also another thing, that you can discover talents. <clears throat> there are many examples of this. Uh, in music, for example, Toscanini and Callas became famous because they had to substitute the, all of a sudden the, the, the director or uh, another singer uh, in another role that uh, she had never played. And then she discovered that it was very good at that, at that level. <clears throat> Nowadays, a lot of these formats, uh, X-Factor, just work on this, okay? So it's, uh, if you think, of, for example, Wikipedia, it works very well, but it's a, it's a bottom-up thing. It's not coordinated uh, from the top. <clears throat> Psychological effects. Many just criticized us because we did not consider psychological effects. Actually, we did not. <clears throat> we neglected them. But you should distinguish a reward for having done very good your, your work to changing the task. Because, for example, if you promote uh, the best surgeon of a, an hospital to the director of the hospital, you may lose twice because you lose the best surgeon you are not certain that he will be the best director that you could have, and you have to substitute him as a sergeant. Okay? <clears throat> so, you should give rewards to those who do their job very well, but without changing their task, or rotating them and trying if he is able also to do very good things in another level, but rotating it. And in fact, we discovered that there is a company that works like that, <coughs> and this this Semco company in Brazil, and uh, the, the CEO is this Ricardo Semler, who applied uh, very new uh, strategies, just rotating people, uh, lowering the uh, number of levels in your organization, and um, 
And so in some ways, it's something quite close to what uh, we propose. And he has become a kind of guru uh, in management. He has written very famous book, but books, but uh, many say, oh, these things work in Brazil, but not here. <laughs> I don't think that this is true. I mean, uh, of course, he was uh, brave, but uh, I mean, he succeeded. Uh, the, the company increased a lot, uh, his um, incomes. Google works like that. I don't know about Rivago, but uh, uh, probably also here, but in Google, you can spend 20% of your time to personal projects, <clears throat> and which you can propose to the company. And most of the projects that uh, the company applies just come out of these uh, uh, bottom-up uh, experiments that single people, employees, uh, try. I already said about research, <clears throat> and uh, someone said that uh, it could be a nice way to reduce gender gap, because uh, sometimes women do not apply to uh, new uh, levels because uh, they're a bit afraid. And this way, uh, choosing by lot, it could be a way to uh, reduce gender gap. Also in religion, I mean, for the Coptic religion, Christian Coptics, uh, the Pope is chosen by lot. Among three, uh, three um, guys who are more or less, have more or less the same qualities. <clears throat> Time is running fast, but uh, I'll, I'll try to close this. And now the Parliament. Uh, I'll try to be very briefly, very brief on that because <clears throat> I want to reach the end of my... Of course, having found these examples in Athens, in democracy, we tried to uh, think uh, if this was, if it was possible to apply this to, uh, to a parliament. And in fact, uh, with other guys, with other colleagues, uh, we wrote another paper in 2011 uh, about the parliament. Why the parliament? Because as I was telling you, in Athens, uh, uh, we had sortition, and it works. It worked very well. Uh, this kind of uh, um, procedure was uh, continued uh, in the Renaissance in Italy, and not, not only in Italy. Many uh, town cities, uh, many big towns like Bologna, um, Firenze, Barcelona, also uh, work like that. Florence, in Venice, this is a very nice example. The Republic of Venice lasted. lasted 500 years, <clears throat> uh, there was a uh, very complicated mechanism uh, of 10 levels, and each level alternate uh, elections and uh, sortition and, and lot lottery. And this was done in order to diminish the power of the most uh, important, most uh, uh, the richest family. <clears throat> and, and this worked for, for, for many, many years. But then what happened? It happened the French Revolution. The French Revolution, uh, people started to be uh, afraid of masses and so started to control masses. So this kind of uh, um, uh, lottery was almost abandoned. But today we still have uh, popular juries in trials uh, which are sorted by lot. And this is done just to mitigate the power of the judge. <clears throat> Uh, I was said, said, but there are also examples nowadays. Ségolène Royal proposed something similar in France, although it was not accepted. There was a similar proposal in the House of Lords uh, in Iceland. Recently, they rewrote the, their constitution with an assembly of people sorted by lot. <clears throat> in Canada, they wrote their uh, new election law in this way because, of course, parties are in conflict. I mean, uh, each one wants to, to approve something that favors him. But uh, uh, this way, this, uh, of course, people, maybe uh, not really technical, but there were uh, um, technicians who could help people in order to, uh, to decide. And then uh, the, propo the proposal law was, uh, uh, I think, approved through a referendum. You know, it's something like uh, when you have a problem in your house, 
Uh, of course, you don't know the, the solution. You call the engineer, you call the plumber, you call whatever uh, you need, maybe many of them, but in the end, you, uh, you are informed and then you decide. It's not the expert who decide, or at least not only the expert. You decide with the help of the expert. <clears throat> so this is what should be democracy. Okay, there are also, in California, they decided about their um, energy plants, for example, in this way. <clears throat> and there is a very well, uh, very well known, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's famous, this experiment made by Galton. Galton was a cousin of Darwin. Uh, he was a mathematician, a statistician, and an anthropologist. Uh, he made many contributors, uh, contribute to science, and... Uh, <laughs> I think he invented the eugenetics, but uh, this experiment, which was published in Nature in 1907, is very interesting. There was a fair, and there was this ox, which uh, uh, had to be cut in pieces, <clears throat> and so he asked to 800 people to guess which would be the, the, the weight of this ox after it was cut in pieces. <clears throat> okay. In a, in a secret way, so each one uh, uh, give a, uh, a piece of paper with his guess. <clears throat> and then, when he made an average over all these suggestions, or people who was not talking to each other, okay, so they were anonymous, <clears throat> the, uh, the average was within 1% close to the correct result. So this gives you a, a very... Uh, a robust uh, reason why democracy should work, because democracy, I mean, and asking uh, the, the opinion of people who maybe are informed, but do not talk to each other, because if you talk to each other, then you can influence each other, and things can not be the same, because uh, uh, conformism can, can completely change these kind of things. Okay, so I... Don't want to go into detail because I don't have time, but uh, for the parliament, uh, we propose to add to, to the two parties that we usually have uh, a certain number of uh, uh, common people who are in this uh, uh, kind of Cipolla diagram, in which you have here personal gain and here the social gain, uh, because parties nowadays do not represent the, uh, the interests of people, and so, uh, in this way, one can mitigate their power. And what we found, uh, there are only two things that uh, these uh, members can do. They can propose uh, uh, laws and they can approve laws if they, they reach a majority. What we have found is actually that uh, if you consider the efficiency of a parliament as the product of the number or percentage of approved laws times the uh, social gain of, of, of these laws, <clears throat> uh, then uh, you reach a, a maximum if you add a certain number of independent paper, of independent uh, parliament member. Yeah, in this case, if the majority party is uh, uh, 51%, uh, only 20 uh, is enough. Uh, in this case, which is 60, you need uh, uh, 140, and so on and so forth. And we found also an analytical formula for that. But it seems that uh, in any case, you get an improvement if you, if you uh, put some, uh, some uh, um, people cho chosen by lot, uh, because uh, they can uh, judge if what uh, the majority party or the other party propose uh, is convincing, is, is good for everyone, and not only for a, set, a, a limited number of, of person, of people. <clears throat> well, we wrote also a book, unfortunately it's all the, it's all the in Italian, <clears throat> but you can find in Amazon where you want. Uh, probably we will translate it in English. <clears throat> Uh, also, this, uh, this paper got, uh, and the book uh, got uh, quite uh, uh, popularity. We went also to the parliament, to the real parliament, to propose this, but of course parties were not so happy about our proposal. 
Uh, and uh, this is the team in this case. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we uh, did something also in the, uh, for financial markets, uh, but uh, I will not think I, I have time to explain in detail. I want to show you only one interesting experiment, which is this one. This uh, psychologist, it's an English psychologist, Richard Wiseman, in <clears throat> 2001, did this interesting thing. He gave uh, 5,000 uh, pounds to a child, to a finance expert, and to an astrologist. And uh, they had to bet uh, on the market, okay? <clears throat> in a virtual way, of course. What he found after one week is that the child, of course, he was helped by, by the parents, but uh, she, chosen, uh, she took a ticket from a, a basket. Uh, she was able to lose uh, only 4.6%, the finance expert minus 7.1%, the astrologist 10%. Well, this is one week. But he continued for one year, and the child uh, was able to win uh, 6%, the finance expert lost almost 46%, and the astrology was not too bad, actually. So, this may be a curiosity, but it's not a curiosity. <laughs> and in fact, this, this kind of thing was done also by a serious journal, by a Wall Street Journal, and uh, they compared uh, for 13 years <clears throat> Uh, the uh, investment made by experts uh, to investment made by darts, just throwing darts, <clears throat> okay? And throwing darts after 13 years uh, was uh, very much uh, uh, mo much more performant than uh, the investment of the experts. <clears throat> but there is also a more recent uh, paper by the CAS Consulting in which uh, of course, he had written a chimpanzee, but actually uh, it's a kind of random uh, choice of uh, the stock uh, you have to invest in. And uh, uh, they did it for a very long period, uh, so $100 in 1968 uh, for investment done by expert arrived to 5,000. But uh, if you use random strategies, uh, you could have uh, half of this uh, uh, random agent uh, who could get uh, uh, 8,700 and others even, even more. <clears throat> so this proves that also in uh, financial markets for very long time investments, not for very short ones, but for very long times, uh, you had better not to trust too much your financial experts. <clears throat> okay, we had some models also on that, but uh, I want to go directly to the last paper that we did, that was the one that was uh, 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 quoted uh, a few minutes ago by Vlad, <clears throat> and it's this one. Talent versus luck. So the question is like this. Is it possible to be successful without the help of luck? And uh, is it true that uh, all the people who are successful are the most talented ones or not? <laughs> I think that each one of us have examples about that. So this is the paper, and uh, you will find it online. <clears throat> But before that, I want to give you a few examples. <clears throat> the first example is La Gioconda, which is a very well famous uh, painting by Leonardo. But it is, the, is it the best painting by Leonardo? No, it is not. It is the most famous because it was robbed by an Italian that was working at Louvre. A lot of uh, newspapers spoke about that. Then it was uh, found again, found again, and uh, uh, it became very, very famous, so that now if you go to Louvre, you, you see these kind of scenes, but it's not the best, the best uh, uh, painting by Leonardo. 
So this is just a case in which chance had a relevant effect. Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire had a lot of problems. Of course, he was very skilled, but he had a lot of problems. One, in one of his first uh, um, uh, interview, he was uh, judged as can sing, can act, was balding, <laughs> can dance a little, just a little. Another nice example, J.K. Rawlings. is probably the most famous uh, English writer at the moment, uh, one of the richest, but she was very poor when she started. And uh, after a divorce in, uh, in Edinburgh, she, she had no job. I mean, she was writing in pubs. And uh, he, she had to propose uh, to 12 editors uh, the first book. And it was published only because the uh, daughter of the editor uh, liked the, 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 the book. And so uh, just because of this, uh, I mean, uh, it, was, it was accepted, it was published, and then it started his career. So completely by chance. And in this case, also endurance in some sense. Another case, Bill Gates. Is he so smart? <clears throat> According to this guy, which is associate professor of strategy and behavioral science in Warwick, uh, maybe he's smart, but uh, he was coming from a very wealthy family. He studied computer science when very few people studied computer science. Uh, her family, his family knew the uh, CEO of IBM, and so he was able to put his system inside. Uh, the first personal computers. And in this case of, of, of examples, when you get an initial advantage, it's very difficult that, that my time is expired. It's very difficult that you get, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, it's a kind of, a, the, you, you take it all. <clears throat> that, that's the point. But there are a lot of studies in, in this sense. I mean, the names are important. If you have a common name or a, a name which is easy to, pro, to pronounce, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, more likely that you get a job or that people like you because you remember, uh, people remember your name. There, there are really studies about that. <coughs> uh, uh, if your name is common, you are more likely to be hired and so on and so forth. So there are many examples of this kind. This economist uh, last year wrote this uh, very interesting book, Success and Luck, uh, with a lot of examples about that. I mean, luck is a lot underestimated in our career. Also the fact that uh, uh, we inherit our genes by our parents. I mean, this is also uh, quite uh, something very important. Uh, it's, it's not our, our merit, it's not our talent. <clears throat> so in order to uh, investigate in detail this, this problem, and also because uh, our IQ, which is a kind of proxy of our talent as a Gaussian distribution. I mean, there are no people who are 10,000 uh, times more intelligent than, than you. I mean, it's just uh, a bit more than, than you. I mean, this is uh, the, the distribution. The average is around 100, and the most intelligent are in this tail. Okay. <clears throat> But so this is the distribution of IQ, so it's uh, in, a, in a way uh, it's uh, a measure of your talent, but uh, the real distribution of wealth and our success uh, was discovered by this guy, Pareto, in, uh, uh, in 1906, uh, and he, he discovered that the distribution is a power law. This means that there are a lot of people which uh, have a very, a very uh, small amount of money, and very few which have a lot. Nowadays, there are, I think, eight people in the world that uh, uh, have got uh, half of, of, of the rest of, of, of the world. <clears throat> so this is even more uh, than it was uh, in 1906. And this is also called the 80-20 rule, because 20% uh, of people have 80% of the entire wealth. <clears throat>
So there is this discrepancy. I mean, uh, uh, Gaussian that becomes uh, uh, a power law. So, I mean, uh, it's, uh, in order to understand that, uh, we constructed also in this case uh, a model, a very simple one. We studied a working period of 40 years with uh, 1,000 agents in a uniformly distributed square. Agents have a normal distribution of talent, and in their life, they encounter lucky and unlucky events, <coughs> which move randomly in this uh, world. And uh, we check every six months if they have uh, had a lucky or an unlucky event. Initially, they have an initial capital of 10 units. Okay? The dynamics is quite simple. If you encounter a lucky event, your initial capital doubles with a probability which is proportional to your talent. Okay? If you encounter an unlucky event, you have an accident, for example, it doesn't matter if you are talented or not, you halve, halve your, your capital, initial capital, and so on and so forth. So very, very, very simple. With these simple dynamics, this is the, our world. You see you have these agents, distributed 1,000 agents, and 500 events, uh, half of that uh, are lucky, red, uh, green, half of that are unlucky, red. They move randomly, so they uh, encounter people, and then we check. The distribution is like that. It has an average around 0.6, and it is a Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of, of 0, 0.1. This is what we see. We get a kind of power law, so a Pareto law. So this simple dynamics is able to produce what we see in reality. I don't know if this is... Uh, it's a bit simpli uh, kind of simplification, but uh, since as physicists we, are, uh, we want to find the, the, the very important ingredients in order to get to, uh, the final result, I mean, this is uh, a nice result, although we know that uh, things are surely more complicated. But the most interesting result is that if you look at the um, people who were most successful during, this was uh, done uh, uh, several times, 100 times. <clears throat> so for all these uh, uh, 100 runs, uh, these are the capital of people that reached the, uh, the highest level of richness or capital in, and, uh, and their talent. You see that uh, those that were more famous, more well, the richest, uh, were not those that are in the tail of the distribution of talent, but those which are close to the average. Okay, so, and this is quite counterintuitive, but uh, not very surprising after all. I mean, because around the average you have a lot of people, and very few are on, on the tail, but <clears throat> this means that uh, you must be very, very lucky and talented in order to reach a very high success. Usually, those who have uh, the highest uh, level of success or of capital, because for us it's just the same thing, is, uh, are those which have a talent which is on the average. This is uh, quite similar. This is the distribution. Of, um, so the, the number of people with the, that kind of talents which were the most successful. And also in this case, uh, uh, this is a bit skewed, but the average is around here. So not in detail. This is, for example, single histories. Uh, this was uh, had an ad, uh, is an agent that had uh, talent uh, very close to the average, but with uh, five lucky events, he got a, a very uh, an incredible success. And this was most talented, but had uh, a number of really unlucky events. But this is the problem in some sense, uh, because there is also another thing. You usually give rewards 
to those who were successful, thinking that they were also the most talented. But this is not true. So <laughs> you, the problem is that you continue to give resources and prizes and things to people that probably were only uh, the luckiest, not the most talented ones. And this is not bad for the most talented only, but also for society. Because if, you, if the best talented people are also those that are the most famous, the most richest, I mean, that are, are known, you can have also a benefit for society because usually they, they give back in some sense uh, uh, what they, <clears throat> they got. So there should be a strategy in order to uh, let these uh, very talented people to emerge. And uh, we define that the uh, kind of criterion, we want to increment people who were in detail, so beyond one standard deviation, in our case is the talent uh, bigger than 0.7, and uh, we give every um, number of, of years uh, against some, some capital, <clears throat> and so we want to see uh, giving back uh, every, for example, five years, a certain amount of money, for example, in research, I mean, uh, but it's, it's in general, if you can have an emergence of the most talented one. And this is a way to, to, to measure it. Well, we compare different strategies. Usually, nowadays, uh, uh, you hear very often, we want to reward the excellence, uh, the best uh, people. Uh, looking at their success, so they are not the most talented. And in fact, if you give, uh, you see here, uh, rewards and, uh, and these funds to 10% of the best, uh, this is what you get in terms of efficiency. Uh, also, 25%, you are here. If you, on the other hand, distribute in a random way to 10%, 25%, or an equal amount to everybody, smaller amount, but to everybody, then the chance that you get uh, most talented people up again is much higher. Okay, I'll skip that. Of course, you can also uh, uh, try to see if you uh, change your distribution. If it's not 50-50, but if it is 80% uh, lucky, for example. Why? Because you live in New York, for example. And in New York, you have more possibility than living in, uh, I don't know, in uh, Mongolia, for example. <coughs> no? And uh, so, uh, the, pos the probability that, uh, that you, you have lucky events uh, is much higher. Of course, this improves. I mean, uh, you have uh, more success in this part. On the other hand, if you reduce uh, this uh, probability of lucky events, uh, this moves in this direction. <clears throat> and I close with this. A lot, a lot of very important discoveries happened by chance. Uh, I, I would say 90% of the most important discoveries are by chance. Fleming discovered penicillin because he forgot a window open in his lab and a mold infected a, 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 a petri dish with some bacteria, and he found, when he came back, uh, penicillin. Tim Berners-Lee invented the WWW protocol at CERN for scientific reason, but now we use for everything nowadays. <clears throat> he could not predict that. These two guys, I already said something about Andre Game, this is this uh, colleague, Konstantin Novoselov, discovered this uh, monoatomic uh, um, material, which is or, or carbon, which is called graphene, which is a fantastic material. It's very thin, transparent, uh, 20 hundred times uh, 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 more robust than steel. I mean, you can use it for, it's conductive, you can use it for many things. <coughs> you know what? They discovered by using this scotch tape on graphite, on, on, a, on a pencil. And uh, repeating this procedure many times, they, uh, they got uh, graphene. Uh, why? Because they had uh, this kind of philosophy. At the end of the week, they had crazy ideas. They want to try. They, they, they found on Fridays, and they tried strange things. 
<clears throat> and this was one of those that really worked out of many, probably. <clears throat> so you don't need much money to do these kind of things, but it's the kind of things that you should try if you want to innovate, if you want to find new solutions. Things that maybe look crazy, but they are not crazy after all. Or not all of them, you have to risk. So, conclusion about this model, okay. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'll skip that because, uh, okay, also in this case we had that incredible impact, but uh, I don't want to speak about that. These are the three guys, uh, apart me, Alessandro Brucchino and Alessio Biondo, who is an economist in this case. And the take-home message, this is important. So luck is important more than we think, but it's up to us how to exploit it. <clears throat> we should open our mind and facing a problem from different perspectives, travel, talk to people, and also uh, find our talent. Very often we don't know which is our talent. If I never try to sing, I don't know if I'm able to sing. If I never try to play tennis, I don't know if I'm good at tennis. And things like that. I mean. Uh, uh, I read, for example, that uh, during the last Olympics, Winter Olympics, Nor Norway was very good and uh, uh, got a lot of medals because he has a, a very nice strategy that uh, uh, since they, they, they are very small, uh, kids are exposed to a lot of sports and, uh, of course, not in a very competitive way. And this is a way to discover new talents. <clears throat> so you have to take risks to expose to new experience, to travel, and... Uh, Try always to see the positive side and also adopt uh, now and then some random decision. And uh, look at these fellows here at the beginning of the last century. All of, of people, most of people thought they were crazy. But nowadays we cannot uh, help uh, uh, flying with the airplanes. Uh, so, they didn't know, they could not do it, or at least they hoped they, they could do it, and, and in the end they succeeded. So once in a while, I think it's a very good to listen to a suggestion of a, your collaborator, maybe less expert than you. you. He may be right, because he has less prejudice than, than you. Okay, I'll close here. And uh, you should use random number generator, but you should find uh, a good one. It's not easy. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, we got time for questions. You know, so if you would like to raise a hand, and you know, let's throw a microphone towards the volunteer, the cube on the table. Uh, this one. Yes. Testing one, two, three. Okay. Uh, where can I get the slides? Are they public, publicly available? I think I will give it to to Vlad. I mean. <laughs> yes. You'll put them online. Yes, of course. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, any more questions? I thought it was inspiring enough. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a good recommendation? Maybe you are shocked. <laughs> Do you have a good recommendation? Random number generator? Oh, uh, well, nowadays, actually, there are. This is just a uh, comic, but uh, if you use the clock on machines, I mean, uh, then I think they're really random. What? Really, the clock of the computers, uh, are, if you use them, then you can get really now uh, random numbers. The problem with random numbers, if you get only one sequence of random number, it's not that difficult. But if you want n uh, uh, random numbers at a time, then it becomes complicated. <clears throat> Just toss it. Uh, you wanted the, oh, okay. Uh, at the beginning of your speech, you you mentioned a computer networking as a as a area of your research. Yes. Or, yeah. So could you tell me something about that? Because I'm professionally doing computer networking, so I'm pretty interested in what you discovered actually. 
uh, about what, sorry, I didn't get uh, your question. About the randomness role in computer networking. In computer networking? Yeah. Um, uh, well, maybe that, yes, there was a sentence, maybe I, I didn't talk about that. Well, for example, um, there are uh, now clusters of computers and uh, you work with clusters, you send job uh, and uh, of different length uh, and you should assign which one should be done um, first uh, and there are queues and things uh, and there are, I think, algorithms to decide uh, which. Uh, I think that uh, uh, some people tried uh, not to do all these things because this is quite costly and just to use uh, in a random way, accept uh, uh, in a random way jobs coming uh, to the cluster. And I think this works much better. In general, when you have um, uh, many strategies and, uh, and uh, it's difficult to decide, uh, it's better to, to use a kind of random uh, decision and um, it works well and uh, in, a, in a certain sense it's more efficient because it's not uh, costly, it's not expensive because you do not have to work on that to decide, so you just take it. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting model. Um, but I have a question because I see it more applicable to traditional companies and not, uh, let's say, more agile companies like Trivago, for example. Like, um, my curiosity is about how did you define talent in your study? That's, that's because very, it, that's difficult. That, that's the most difficult thing. In fact, uh, we use as a proxy the distribution of, uh, of IQ. But uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's not something that uh, it's uh, so simple. Talent, uh, in our case, uh, uh, is not only intelligence, it's skill, uh, being able to uh, talk to people, to work in groups. So there are many things that can enter into this, uh, uh, this uh, quality, and it's difficult to measure it in a, in a quantitative way. But, uh, uh, also, if you don't know exactly uh, what it is uh, talent uh, for that person, I think that working in this way, you can promote, you can give a chance to everyone, and you can give a chance also to those who could maybe had no chance, and in this way, they could not discover their talent. So yeah. even if you don't know, I mean, uh, it's something hidden, but uh, in this way, you can have a possibility to uh, have the emergence of the most talented ones. Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely. Uh, here we think that you don't have to hire the expert, but the person able to learn the job because we are considering like that a person can e uh, always learn, right, and improve yes. their job. So the talent can also change during the study, right, somehow. This is, that is not talent, uh, that is ability that you can, uh, you can uh, imp improve the way you can sing, but uh, I mean, if you sing well, uh, you sing well because you have a, a natural talent. Uh, and, and this sometimes you have to discover because uh, you, you don't know. If you do not expose yourself to experience, especially when uh, you are young, when you are more possibility to learn and to discover your potentiality, then it's, uh, you have lost something. So that, that's, uh, I mean, the, the message of, of my talk is not that uh, luck is important, so I stay in my room waiting for something. Because this is not what uh, will facilitate, I mean, your, your success if you are interested. I mean, you have to uh, discover new opportunities, to move to other places where there are more opportunities, for example, to risk, because it's not certain that you will succeed. But if you do not do that, I mean, you lose something, you lose some possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, sorry, because like, it's extremely connected with what she was saying. <clears throat> Thank you very much again, Professor, for coming over and explaining this. And um, uh, I mean, it's not a question. I would just like to follow up on the discussion. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, there's an opportunity for each talent individual to get exposure, exposure to different uh, stimulus or something. Yes. Because like, okay, every person has hidden talents. I might be good on 
singing, whatever, yeah. if nobody has given me. This is, this is just an example. But just uh, an example, <clears throat> right? But then like, okay, I see somehow the risk of the company when uh, given the possibility or the opportunity which talent uh, to test this skill by promoting them instead of like, okay, in the modern companies, I'm not saying about Trivago, but just like agile company in general, uh, where they normally try to uh, stimulate people, giving like additional or extra task, probably it's like the um, example of the 20% of Google, even it's like it's no lift at all in that company, but it's just like, it's going to the right direction, right? I'm the company, I know that you are extremely good on singing, but I want to test you on cooking, because probably you sure. might be good on that too. Uh, that's correct, in fact, I think that another possibility is, uh, yeah. uh, uh, rotating task. Yeah. This has another advantage that uh, uh, if uh, that person is missing for some period, you have another one who is able to do the same job. I mean, if you rotate uh, the task of people, people know more about the company, for example, they are able to do different things, they are able to substitute others, and maybe they find also a place where they are mm. best at. For sure, absolutely. Actually, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, there's, I think there's no one from our TSC department. TSC means HR, let's say. And uh, we introduced... But I leave the slides. So. We introduced, <laughs> no, because we introduced the job rotation a couple of years ago and has been like uh, initiated by our managing director. That is which responsibility. So the head of finance went to be head of marketing, the head of BI, whatever. And it's pretty, it's pretty nice. And then it's like after it's been like it happened to different people. It happened to me as well and to other people in the company. And I truly believe it. But then like I see uh, an opportunity, but then the risk. And it's not of easy course, for the company. Of course, there, there are a lot of risks. There are right? risks, but uh, you should uh, minimize this risk mm. and, and try to maximize uh, the opportunities. Uh, of course, how but you I, I, I show you an example of a company that works very well. This same co company works very yeah. well. When you look at, at the books uh, who have been written by this okay. uh, guy, I think uh, you will find a nice uh, suggestion. I mean, I will look at it for sure. I just think it's just like personally, and then I will share it because I don't want to bother anyone. The property is just like a culture of like uh, stimulating people could be an option instead of like promoting, because I mean, promoting can be kind of like having this risk. Yeah, the, the point is that uh, why we think that promoting is, is good for people, because you get more prestige, you, your salary increases, but if you pay more people, who are, uh, even at a lower level, but do their job very well, mm -hmm. there is no, no much uh, um, uh, desire to, to mm. be promoted to another task. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> mm. because you can remain where you, you are able to work very well mm -hmm. and, uh, and be paid more, for example. It's just the same in, uh, in teams, in, uh, in soccer, in other I mean, there is uh, one guy that is, uh, is very good and uh, is not promoted to another task. I mean, he has other kinds of rewards. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Yeah, maybe an interesting tidbit. Um, the, the the word talent is a relatively fuzzy term. Yeah. But there are client, uh, there are clinical psychologists who have have done ex examinations and and studies on this, and they've actually found that what, on average, is generally regarded as talented in whichever field that is, most closely actually correlates with what you can measure in clinical psychology in what we call cognitive ability or intelligence. So that's actually the same thing mm. on average. It, it so could, that's could be not curious. an expert, uh, not a psychologist. But, but I mean, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a very good uh, clinical psychologist who has a lot of talks on YouTube, uh, Jordan Peterson, and he talks a lot about this issue, how, how intelligence actually uh, very closely correlates with, with a lot of these things that we consider success or and there's like four other factors that play into this, but intelligence is a very important one. Yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. And interesting I, to know. I'm sure that they don't measure that only by solving logical problems. I mean, uh, you, you can be uh, can have a very IQ if you speak a lot of languages. So if you are able, for example, talent of speaking languages, for example, this is another one. Just because your brain is is done in a certain way. There is a question to your left. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot. I totally buy the argument. <laughs> I just wonder, I mean that the media, um, uh, re, you know, 
talks about you and your idea. I, I totally get that, but how do people actually actually react? Like, did you hear a lot of, for example, research promotion um, um, authorities that say, yes, we now give 10% of our uh, funds uh, randomly? Um, I, I'd be interested in, like, how, which other examples, apart from the Semco company, uh, did adapt some I, I, I give way. you another example. Yeah. One of the most technological societies, to, that one of Israel. Israel has a very interesting uh, system of entrepreneurship. Uh, it promotes a lot of startups. Uh, it gives you money if you have a startup, and they know that uh, uh, they will lose money. Uh, so they lend you money to, for your startup, uh, without asking to, uh, to have it back. But out of this, if one of the startup is able to succeed out of 20, 30, then they get something back. And uh, it works very well. It's one of the most technological mm -hmm. uh, countries in the world. So I think uh, it's also for entrepreneurship, it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, correct. Uh, um, message, but I think this is quite well known. The problem is with public administration mm -hmm. and uh, with governments in general who are very afraid of that. But suppose you have a garden and uh, there are a few plants in this garden that you like very much and you give water only to this one. I mean, will you have a, a very good garden? No, because <laughs> you need also the other plants. I mean, everyone. Everything is correlated. I mean, so you cannot build a cathedral in the desert. So everything is, is correlated. So you need to give, maybe not too much, but uh, some water to everyone. Thanks. Um, could you please recommend a good book on underlying math, like statistics, probabilities theory, that stuff? For that? Yeah. Well, what we do actually is, um, um, a ABM, agent-based models. So it's, uh, um, I think you can look around, you will find another. But uh, we use a lot this kind of uh, NetLogo platform, which is free, you can download for free. It works uh, uh, in Java, in, uh, in Unix, uh, iOS, and uh, Windows. So no problem. And you can uh, have a lot of models that you can modify. It's quite uh, easy to, to work with, uh, to simulate these kind of things. Mm, okay. There is also a manual line, it's free. Any more questions, guys? Well, you know, let's, let's end it here then. If you have, a, if you come up with a question, you know, we're gonna stick around, feel free to come to Professor Repsard. Oh, you can like contact me by email, no problem. I'm, <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, so. Of course. <laughs> no of problem. Course. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, thank you all for joining us. Uh, you know, that kind of concludes the evening, and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>